Okay. Are we ready? Oh goodness. Let's do this. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my very favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at the art of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And uh, this is the painting we are going to recreate. And I think we're also going to recreate this one as well. So these also happen to be two of his most well-known and most uh, expensive paintings ever sold at auction as well. And both recently purchased for millions and millions and millions of dollars. So we'll talk all about that. I'm a huge Basquiat fan and uh, I've been wanting to, to tackle this great artist and attempt to do it some justice for a while. So uh, today is finally the day. And I'll let you know that I am probably going to be experimenting with a little bit of oil pastels as well. So if you have some pastels or you have some uh, oil sticks, uh, oil paint sticks, which I have, I just realized, oh, I, they're not too far. Huh, lucky they were just there. <laughs> These I haven't used in forever. I don't even know if these still work, but these are oil sticks. So this is actually what Basquiat would have used, um, which are basically oil paints in stick form. And as you start to paint with them, they activate and kind of turn into paint. Now these are probably 20 years old and haven't been used maybe in 20 years. I could try to break them out and we'll see how they work. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I, I, that's funny. I, I, just as I said that, I'm like, oh, I have some, and then they were right there. Okay, so here's oil paints or oil uh, pastels. Lots of little things coming out everywhere. Okay, so let's. Um, I'm so ex I'm a little. Bit, there's so many things I want to say w in relationship to today's episode. Uh, so let's see. The, Let's get started really quickly. I want to let you know that there are outlines for both of the paintings that I'm about to do, and you can download them from the Dropbox folder in the description below. So for this painting, you saw the outline for that, and then for this one, there's uh, the outline for it as well. And I just did these outlines on the Procreate app, uh, or use it on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And, you're, and if you'd like to download those, they're free. Uh, anyone can download them and you can print them out. And if you click on the Dropbox folder, you're gonna see all of these files. There are almost 100 different folders in here. Many of them contain two or three or four pictures in uh, paintings that you can do. So where are we? We're right here and you'll see that there's six files basically the only difference is that there's a pdf and jpegs of the outline so that you can print them out i just uh also want to let you know there's a private facebook group just for people like yourself you can join the group take a photograph of the painting you made today upload it to the group and once a month i go through all of these files and take a look at them and offer people feedback so if that's again another free thing that anyone on earth could take advantage of if they should wish um, many people find that very very helpful and useful and even if you don't contribute to the uh, facebook group or upload your pictures a lot of people just tune in to watch anyway because it's a they can certainly take a couple little details there and apply them to their own artwork so let's before i start diving into his biography let's get these paintings running and then we can um we'll we'll circle back while the the first layer of paint is drying here oh let me show you how i got these <laughs> outlines onto the canvas here i knew there's always something that i want to share so i'm going to play this video and uh, oh, I don't want that. I want that was a video we did. Here's here we go. Okay, so 
I am going to be painting this on a 9 by 12 sized canvas board, a canvas panel or board, which you can buy from the dollar store for a buck. I bought mine off of Amazon. I was using the dollar store ones, and then I tried using some off Amazon uh, that are the, basically the same thing you can get at your local art supply store, and they are much better uh, for another extra dollar. So twice as much, but when it's we're talking the difference between a dollar and two dollars, they're definitely better than the one dollar versions. The links are in the description below. And then you can see I'm using some carbon paper here. And you can use carbon paper or graphite paper. You put a sheet underneath your drawing. I just use a red pencil and uh, just go over these lines. And it's self-explanatory. You can see I'm not doing every single line here just really quickly because we're going to be painting over everything so none of these lines are going to stay there until the very very end they're just there to help us get the basic composition in and you can see i've used the carbon paper many many times so let's do this again here's another one you can see me this is the other painting that we're going to do or the really the first painting the one in the <laughs> thumbnail um and again i'm just going to tape it down I usually just sort of try to get it roughly in the middle. Sometimes I move it a little bit off to the side or up or down just uh, um, because compositionally I feel like it needs that, but these ones are basically right in the middle. And sometimes you got to move that carbon paper around because sometimes it's a little bit, at least mine is smaller than an actual 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. So if you don't move it, then you might <laughs> take the... Uh, look at it and realize, oh, a bunch of those marks didn't transfer. Oops. And there we go. So, once you've done that, you will find you've got your canvases. And then these, you can keep it. What's interesting is they... I have this double-sided carbon paper which leaves images on the other side so if you did want to do a mirror copy version of them you could just trace this image if you want right I save all of them and sometimes I do little test stuff on them um, you could just print them out in color with colored pencils onto those uh, eventually maybe I'll do a kids coloring book or something um, okay so, I'm going to put some paint on the canvas here. And as I typically do, I apply some warm yellow onto the canvas. Did uh, Jean-Michel do exactly this? I don't think so. Uh, he certainly wouldn't have used this color. I will say, though, he painted on all sorts of surfaces. We're going to take a look at his work here in just a few minutes, but he painted on canvas, on cardboard, on paper. One of the paintings we're looking at was made on paper and is therefore one of the highest selling or the most expensive works on paper ever created. And so I'm just using this warm yellow And this is the only ever time I ever put water into the into on my painting. In fact, I'm just gonna put a little bit more. So I gotta get it over two canvases here. Traditionally artists would put a warm brown on the background, as what we call this the imprematura, or is what the Italians called it back in the Renaissance time when they were started to do this because this speeds up the painting process. Often uh, they would use that color that shows through as part of the painting, especially when you're doing figures and landscapes, it's really useful. And this is just my variation of it. I used to do put the, the warm brown on just as all of the great artists throughout history have done. And as a time-saving measure, I started just using the warm yellow. And there is a difference. 
But the difference is so negligible uh, to be hardly noticeable, especially if you're a beginner artist. And then I've started doing this on my own paintings that I sell and exhibit because I kind of like the look. It gives it this kind of warm glow. And who doesn't want a warm glow? Especially in the middle of winter here in Vancouver. It is pouring rain outside. <laughs> My daughter and I went for a big long walk this morning and we both have rain suits and rain boots and while we didn't get wet, uh, our fingers and noses were very cold. So, especially when the sun comes up late and goes down early, a warm glow is exactly what I want most in life. And if you're going to have paintings up in your house and you're, they're meaningful and valuable to you, then it's sort of like having a little bit of a warm fireplace crackling on the wall. So, I'm just putting this warm yellow on, and then I just kind of brush it out to try to get as even of a surface as possible. I don't mind if there's a little bit of inconsistency, especially because we're going to paint over all of it. Really, the thing I, I want to avoid the most is just texture, but there's big lumps or things like that, because then that will show through onto the next surface. Having said that, if you are going to have lumps or things showing through to the next surface, Jean-Michel Basquiat would be the artist that would make most sense to do that with. Because we are going to build up a little bit of surface here with some different colors as we go. So let's move these guys out of the way and then do a little art history um, review and learn a little bit about this artist. There looks like there was some difficulty with the stream. If you want to let me know in the chat that you're watching and things are working, you can hear my voice. That would be awesome because some YouTube gave me a little warning that something had stopped and restarted. So I want to make sure that I'm actually alive and I'm not just talking to myself like some crazy person in their basement, which is not entirely untrue, as you probably know if you've seen me a few times. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about who he was, because he unfortunately died at a very young age, at the age of 27, the, the age that Kurt Cobain and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and all the famous people, um, that seems to be that magical age of 27. Oh, I see John says, I see you. Great, thanks John, I appreciate that. So, he was born in 1960 in Brooklyn and died in New York City, uh, just across the, the way in Manhattan in 1988, really at the height of his, um, of his popularity and, and critical, critical recognition. Uh, who knows what would have happened had he lived longer, which is, you know, uh, it's... It, him really especially is such a tragedy because you just think like man he was just really getting started really he had only been making art for maybe eight years seven years professionally um so just like you would think of like vincent van gogh or tom thompson two other legendary artists who had very brief but very bright, intense, um, creative careers. So anyway, sorry, uh, Basquiat, 
he was he's born let me see if we go to his biography there might be some info here that i can so he's born his father was haitian uh his mother was america where i was from uh puerto rico and uh, which is a part of the united states i should say it's american right Although some people in Puerto Rico would like to be independent or would like to be officially a state of the United States. Um, and he had uh, an older brother who died before he was born and two younger sisters. And as a child, the, the parents separated. So he spent a lot of time with his mother and his mother took the family to the Brooklyn Museum of Art a lot when they were young. And that really helped foster a lifelong interest in art, especially in Jean-Michel. Uh, he would draw cartoons and comic books, and when he was seven years old, he got in a car accident. A car hit him while he was playing in the street, and he had he basically had to have his spleen removed. And during this sort of long period of convalescence, his mother got him a copy of Grey's Anatomy. Now, not the television show Grey's Anatomy, um, but the, the Grey's Anatomy... I, you know, I, I know I have a copy of it in a box over there somewhere, but Grey's Anatomy is like a thick textbook that was originally written for doctors uh, to learn to understand the human body. It's you know a hundred, almost two hundred years old book, so it's mostly used these days by artists who are interested in studying anatomy because. You know, this textbook is probably long out of date in terms of its medical use for contemporary doctors, but the human anatomy itself, in terms of drawing, is, you know, uh, unchanging, right? It's not like we've discovered a new set of muscles or anything, right? Uh, that would change radically our concept of how to draw the human body. So while, so he read this textbook and then began drawing and that really, he uses images from Grey's Anatomy later on in his uh, artistic career over and over and over again. And probably we see a little bit of this in the paintings we're going to recreate today. His mother was unfortunately committed to a psychiatric hospital and sort of in and out. And so his father took over the parental duties. And while his father imparted some useful skills, such as teaching him French and Spanish, there, it was not a particularly happy household, and Jean Michel was he, he ran away from home several times, and uh, got in. You know, he he would run away and sleep on the street. He would spend time with his friends, and New York, New York City in the late 1970s, while it was this really exciting place for artists to be and you have punk rock and hip-hop music rap music all sort of really generating from this kind of ground zero in terms of the the city it was a pretty violent city you know there was documentaries talking about you know new york city goes through bankruptcy in mid 1970s it's there's uh there are lots of open drug use, uh, housing, you know, or cars on fire, people standing around barrels of on fire, a lot of homelessness. So being a young kid who's homeless in the streets of New York at the end of the seven, late 70s would have been, you know, I, you could say maybe was there was probably some really exciting moments to it, but I can imagine it being a really scary, scary situation. Um, and I think that kind of goes into, you know, he, even though he becomes super successful later in life, I think he's always a little bit guarded, I think, throughout um, much of his life. And I think that is one reason why when he descends into uh, sort of a drug oblivion towards the end of his life, he's really incapable of reaching out for help and and even when people do reach out for help he's kind of got that uh guard up so when he's you know at this period of time he becomes really good friends with a classmate al diaz and him and al diaz uh, kind of form this graffiti duo and the two of them are become really famous for creating this moniker called samo 
or Samo, depending on who you want to talk to about it, the pronunciation. And um, Samo is this, you know, it's spelled S A M O, and it starts this tag, as it was called, starts appearing all over New York City at this, you know, in the late 1978. And it's kind of one of these things, again, there's just graffiti everywhere in New York, on the subways, on every, you know, delivery truck and alleyways, buildings that are closed down. It's just like there's saturated graffiti, right? And, and I remember watching a documentary a few years ago about like the transit system and graffiti. And so he's really also at the ground zero of modern graffiti movement. You know, there's been graffiti since back in the Roman era and and we know when, let's say, Roman soldiers were invading different parts of the world because of the graffiti they left on various different monuments. So it's not like graffiti is a, a new thing, but graffiti as sort of how we think of it today with spray cans and that kind of thing is really a modern, like from the late 1970s, again, and in New York is where it features most prominently because being it's kind of slightly lawless place if you're a graffiti artist you can pretty much paint anywhere you want right so the same oath uh moniker appears all over the place because there's two artists spray painting it all over so people are like what is going on who's doing this and when it is sort of revealed um in the subculture that it's jean michel and 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 of course his friend al diaz that also contributes to a certain kind of cultural cachet, right? Because people are, of all stratas and income levels have seen this appearing. And when they find out, oh, it's this like 17 year old kid and his friend, like, huh, you're the one. Because it's not only just the name, there often be these like uh, poetry, like quotes from, from famous poems or things that they created themselves. Um... Let me see. Wow, there's so much to talk about. Like, I mean, I'm just glancing at this. Uh, all of the people in the New York uh, art movement at the time, Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf, um, there's CBGBs, which is down in the Lower East Side. I went to Cooper Union School of Art, which is down, um, uh, right, was right across the street from CBGB. CBGBs is now gone, which is a very famous rock and roll punk rock bar um and this is right in the epicenter of where jean-michel and all of his friends were living um what else could i say really quickly because you can see there's tons of stuff we'll talk about his relationship with andy warhol here because that's um and where he kind of takes an even greater step higher from sort of being a, a well-known street artist to really catapulting into the highest stratospheres of the art world. And so we'll, let's talk a little bit more about his biography as we're painting here because uh, here's just quickly the couple of paintings that we're going to be working on. Here's Untitled from 1982, sold for one hundred and ten million dollars just a few years ago uh, to the uh, Yusaka Maezawa which is uh, he's one of the most richest persons on earth he's a founder of basically like the Amazon of uh, of Japan and Yusaku Maezawa is also the person that has bought a, a rocket ship trip around the moon uh, from Elon Musk, which is supposed to take place in the next few years. And uh, I was in the news a whole bunch on the cover of every newspaper in Canada uh, last year when that news came out because a bunch of people, uh, if you know anything about me, part of my ambition in life is to go to the moon and make a painting. And so that's a whole other thing we can talk about today if you're interested. Um, and this is the other painting that we're going to talk about and we're going to paint too. So Head from 1982, same period of time, which is really at the very beginning of when he's really taking off. Um, and so this, this is a drawing or painting on paper, depending on what we talk about it, which sold for $15 million. Uh, just a few, last couple of years ago, 
and is his most expensive work sold on paper, but I think has uh, got to be one of the most expensive artworks ever sold on paper, let alone a painting or artwork by Jean-Michel. So uh, here's the Sotheby's page. Let's just take a quick look at the art that he's that he's did and known for. So we're looking at some of his early art here. Um, so these are, you know, early sketchbook drawings. He's so well known these days that I bet you some of these little doodles he did on, you know, notepads and people's houses when he was sleeping on their couches. I'm sure each one of these little doodles probably are selling for ten, twenty thousand dollars because the as you just saw an actual painting um or drawing on paper can sell for 15 million dollars right so especially some of those older works are often kind of forgotten about by many artists but if you're a collector getting your hands on them would be um, a, a big coup i would say you know again as he started to become bigger and bigger and more and more well known people would just hand him stuff and say sign this or paint this and so people would show up at his house and give him something and uh so he that's an, a big part of of his uh, of his story is really how he becomes exploited by many of the people around him who especially when he starts getting into drugs he became a heroin intravenous heroin user and you know he would he would trade you know an artwork or a painting for what would amount to be like 20 or 30 dollars worth of heroin and people that that knew he had this addiction would show up at his place with this little thing and be like hey i'll take that painting you want and right and so just like we've seen with a number of other major famous celebrities uh michael jackson perhaps uh you know, he ends up being surrounded by it, these sort of sycophants who will, who won't say no to him and who only encourage him because they give him a little bit of drugs, he makes a little bit of art, and then they just go and sell it for a couple of tens of thousands of dollars, even while he was alive, right? And there are stories of him showing up at rich people's houses and he sees a painting that he again traded for with a friend on the wall for and he's like oh where did you get that oh i bought it at some off of somebody for fifty thousand dollars they're like fifty thousand like like that friend of mine like so that you know again goes when he's as he's sort of spiraling down who can someone like that trust now there are friends uh who he was he was great friends with some some very important artists who are still alive today uh who did try to help but if you've ever known anyone who's uh in the crux of of, of hardcore addiction it is it, it's it's pretty tough to help them right uh so as we can see here with his work there's also again text words poetry play a big part in his art right so and this goes all the way back to samo period where he's writing samo and a poem or really simple drawing and that again is goes directly into the paintings he's making so um there's you know i i, I can imagine there's probably some people tuning in right now who may have never heard of him who are looking at some of this work and being like really this looks pretty childlike these really this is who we're gonna be trying to replicate look at this guy like he can barely draw uh i i do i'm positive i know that he could draw and paint maybe not as great as some of the other artists we've talked about but he he didn't have any formal art training but again he would he was studying the gray's anatomy textbook and drawing directly from it and i think uh he i don't think he was really concerned or he really could care less about what people thought about his drawing ability he there's a, a rawness to the his expression 
that comes through with just using whatever materials and tools and paints are around. As he gets more and more famous, he, he's not want for money, so he can buy the most expensive paints that he wants. But using things like oil sticks, right, oil paint sticks, um, allows him to sort of paint with kind of like a crayon type of tool. And uh, it's... It's something that is pretty unique to, to his own uh, approach to painting. And I think he's really responsible for popularizing uh, not only graffiti and making turning graffiti into the mainstream. You could say positive or negative things about that. Some people, um, you know, I'm not really a fan of, of, of m most graffiti where people just write, you know, Jim on the wall. I think that's that's really juvenile, but there are examples of incredible graffiti artists uh, who've done incredible artworks, and uh, I think without Jean Michel having elevated graffiti to a legitimate art form, uh, it would be really interesting to think of how this that art form is perceived today, right? You could see like him painting on like there's there are doors like so there, and there's examples in fact I should just mention there's a I think this is a great movie and looking at Rotten Tomatoes it doesn't have the best reviews um, but this film Basquiat which was directed by Julian Schnabel and Julian Schnabel was he is still a, a painter and made his name as a, a painter he he's made his name for making these giant paintings with broken plates and all sorts of things that were glued into the surface of the painting um, and since then Julian Schnabel's become a, a, an Academy Award winning film director but this I think is his first movie that he made and, and they were again really really good friends Schnabel Basquiat slept on Schnabel's couch for years uh, you know, maybe not every night, but anyway, I highly recommend that movie. A great movie. Uh, Jeffrey Wright is plays uh, uh, Jean Michel in the film, and Jeffrey Wright, uh, what else has he done? He's been in a lot of things, but uh, and David Bowie uh, plays Andy Warhol in the film. Highly recommended. I, I think it's a great movie if you're looking for. I think it's on Netflix or Prime or something these days. Um. Let's just finish... Oh, anyway, the reason I mention that is there's several scenes in that movie where he's, you know, at somebody's house, and somebody just goes like, here's a, here's an oil stick, or here's a, a pencil. Make something. And he just sort of doodles on somebody's door, and immediately that person just starts taking the door off the hinges and putting it in bubble wrap, because they're just like, wow, this is... This is... I'm going to be able to buy myself a new house. And he's just like, what? Like... You know, it's sort of like this golden goose thing. And you can imagine how that would really play with somebody's mind. See, in the chat there, uh, John says, Banksy is indebted to Basquiat. For sure, yeah. Um, uh, we'd, I don't think we somebody like Banksy would, would be, you know, uh, have the respect uh, and recognition that he would have today. Certain, I mean, absolutely would not have if it wouldn't have been for Basquiat. Now, you might say, well, what about Keith Haring? and uh, a number of other graffiti arts at the time. Keith Haring, we did a painting on Keith Haring. I'm a huge Keith Haring fan, um, who was, uh, again, a great friend with Jean Michel, who was also responsible for popularizing graffiti, but Keith Haring also had a very different approach um, and I think was, was more business savvy and, and uh, certainly wasn't uh, a... Um, you know, didn't wasn't doing all of these drugs, so his mind he was a little bit more he was he was able to better manage his career, I suppose you could say. Okay, so anyway, let's looks like these canvases are ready and dry, so let's get to painting uh, because I there's so many things I want to talk about that um, I can talk about them while we're painting. So what I want to do is put some paint on my palette here. And I think I'm going to basically use every color um, because one thing that I want to do, is like when we're trying to recreate this painting, is we're going to be putting, 
I mean, there's different ways to go about it. One is we, we could just sort of try it best just to quickly replicate the, the final layer of paint that we see on the canvas. Um, and that, that maybe there's certain people who are going to do that, and I would love to see that. Uh, if people do do that, I would love to see those on the, the Facebook page. But uh, the way that he worked was sort of just this layering and layering and layering of colors and lines. And he might have like five or six paintings on the go simultaneously and just moving between the back and forth between them. So, um, which is, you know, one of the methods I often do when I'm working on my own artwork, I'll often have a lot of paintings started and that way I can mix a color and apply it on a bunch of different works as a time-saving um, measure. I'll also, okay, so remember I, I mentioned that there's oil pastels, which I might, I probably will, I think I'm going to use, maybe, <laughs> and my oil sticks, which I, I don't even know if these are still, will work, but the one thing is if you are going to use oil, or even oil paint, you want to do that after you've done whatever acrylic you're going to use, because you can paint oil on top of acrylic as much as you like, but you can't paint acrylic back on top of oil paint because um, it will resist the oil paint will resist any water-based material over top of it oil and water don't mix <laughs> so but the oil paint will stick to the acrylic on here but you can't paint on top so if you're going to use those just think about saving them until you've got maybe a base layer created um, I also may use some Posca pens these acrylic pens I've got a whole bunch of them in different colors so I might use those for maybe some small line work perhaps okay so how should we begin this Whew, I'm gonna take a sip of tea and, and uh, let me think Okay, so what I'm talking about is you can see that there's paint underneath all of these surfaces. So really the last layer is this black. So hmm. What I what I really want to do is I really want to have a lot of fun today and I really want to play and I hear from people all the time like I want to how do I loosen up how do I get more freedom when I'm painting how do I uh, stop being so anal retentive right Basquiat would be a great person to um, to, to help you break out of, of uh, your um, fixation on perfection right? perfection is the enemy of art the more you're obsessed with perfection the further you're gonna get to perfection so really there's two ways we can go about it one is which we could sort of paint these dark black lines and then we could paint color in between them and we could basically replicate this painting exactly the way it is or the way that i really want to approach today's painting is with a lot more freedom and it may differ substantially from the original painting by the time we're done so for instance, like we would paint the way that I would want to paint this is, is maybe putting a whole bunch of this warm, actually even before this, this cool blue, painting things underneath it and then putting like this, you know, X and O's over top and then painting over top of that. So I, I guess where do we want to begin with either of these paintings? You know, with this one, I think I, I think it might work well to kind of get this kind of um, unbleached titanium eggshell color down first and then let that dry and then we can also paint over top of that okay so maybe I'm gonna actually jump to this one really quickly and just mix that background color that we see here so uh, let's yeah, let's, I'm going to use, actually, I'm going to mix it with a smaller brush. So to, to get that color, which is kind of like a, 
a, just a bit of like a dirty um, brown, dirty, dirty whitish brown. I think I'm gonna make it a cool, should I make it a colder color? Yeah, let's make it a colder color. So I'm gonna take some warm yellow, cool blue, and some cool red. Mix this up together. So basically what I'm doing is just creating a brown. Okay, and I just wanna get as much of that paint off of my brush. And I'm just going to wipe the excess off. I'm not going to clean my brush, but I'm just wiping the excess off because what I want to do is now take my white. Maybe that's enough. And then mix my brush into this color. And let's see how close we are. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Maybe even a little bit uh, too brown, or well, so we'd put more white in here. If if it's too dark, you're gonna have to put tons of white in there to lighten it up. So if it's easier just to mix another one to the side to kind of lighten it up. FYI, if you're if you're in that situation, I'm also just gonna put some glazing fluid in here to make it a little bit more transparent and that way I don't lose all my pencil lines so I uh, you could if you really want to just jump directly to this and skip over the warm yellow that we painted here but I still really like that glow that we get so um, let's And don't worry if it's absolutely perfect as either, because you know this the what we're in, we kind of want a, almost a bit of a an uneven quality to it too, right? So this is an instance where a little bit of unevenness in the paint actually works well. Usually we want a pretty even surface, but there are times where a little bit of an uneven surface actually benefits us. you can see the image coming back through so it's just once you get that paint on you might be like oh I've lost the original it's gone right you just sort of brush it around and if it really worse comes to worse you could always take a rag and just delicately kind of wipe some off I like that. Again, there's going to be this warm yellow that's coming through here. That's something I like. I mean, obviously, that's why I've been using it for all these paintings. But... Okay, so sl after a while of doing this, the paint starts to kind of dry and then I end up sort of just actually taking paint away rather than painting over existing paint. So you can only do this for a while and then it starts, you get diminishing returns and then it starts 
actually working against you. So I think that's about as good as it's gonna get unless I let it dry and then do another layer over top. Cool. And there is, I don't know if you can see, the image is still there. It's just much more subtle. <laughs> Some great comments in there. John says, give yourself permission to fail. After all, if every painting you make is good, you're not taking enough risks. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And Pascal says, allow for happy accidents to occur. Yes, absolutely. I get you 100%. Yes, definitely. Uh, if I, I agree 100%. If you're not, if, if, if you're not taking some risks, then I guess that would feel, you know, you feel kind of safe. But painting is a, is an opportunity to take some risks and to, and to have a little bit of danger in your life where really nothing is at stake. Yeah, maybe the painting doesn't turn out the way that you want it to. It could turn out, but maybe not the way you want it to. Um, and so what? Maybe you've, quote unquote, you believe anyway that you've wasted a few hours of your life. I would argue that every painting is a learning experience if you choose to look at it that way. And even if things aren't going the way you want, sometimes there's an opportunity there to see and embrace something new that's the core of the bob ross happy accident thing is that yeah you maybe you put something there you spill paint accidentally and you're upset at first but if you're like hey the way that paint spilled whoa i would never have done that the way it just happened that's really cool i'm going to embrace that Mm-hmm. Okay, so we'll set this aside, let it dry, and then while that's drying, let's come back here. Just gonna see if I can wipe off some of this paint. So it doesn't. Sometimes I find like if there's a lot of color on the table, it kind of gets into my field of view, my peripheral vision while I'm painting, and I find that really distracting. You know, it's sort of like if you're trying to do something that requires a lot of focus and you're looking out the window and across the street there's police cars and ambulances and firemen running and you're just like it's very hard to like tune that out and it and it, that's a very dramatic example but it's the same sort of thing if I'm if I'm trying to paint this here and there's splatters of a bunch of other colors around there my those things start invading the painting even though they're not on there but they invade the way i'm thinking so that's just the way that i feel i know some there's lots of artists who just love splatters all over the place and my studio is definitely a disaster my wife would laugh and because she probably thinks that, you know i am very messy but when it comes to my painting i like a certain amount of order so um how we <laughs> let's get to this painting here so I am just going to play for a little bit. You'll have to indulge me. I'm going to suggest you do the same. And worse comes to worse, if we lose some of the, the, the proportions of where the eyes and things go, we can always do take our template that we had from before and transfer it again. Now, probably some of these marks are going to be transferred to the canvas, but if there's ever been a painting that we've ever made where a little bit of graphite paper showing up on the surface, this would be the time for that to happen. If you really want, if you lose complete control, which if you want to lose complete control and you've never lost complete control, this would be a time to lose complete control. So let's take... Let's just dive right in here. What I mean, there's no good way to start when you want to make a mess. You just make a mess, right? So how about let's take some purple. And you can certainly play with all sorts of color in this painting. I'd invite you to do that, in fact. So I'm going to take some cold red and some warm blue and mix that up. 
This is going to get me the, the most saturated purple I'm capable of getting. And I love purple as a color. My favorite hockey team is the Los Angeles Kings in their um, old uniforms from the 1960s and 70s uh, and 80s were all basically the colors of the Lakers. And I just love that purple color that's in there. Or as the Lakers or the, the and the Kings like to refer to it as Forum Blue, even though it's clearly purple. I don't know what blue about what's anyway. That's a whole other discussion. So I'm gonna paint with just this, and I'm gonna let's just start going around here and putting paint onto the canvas. And you're like, whoa, there's no purple right there. Oh, really? I mean, there's blue over top. I don't know if there's purple over top. So I'm just going to... Why not? So I'm going to maybe try to preserve some of the basic shape of the face and maybe where the eyes go so that I don't get totally lost. Um... Let's take a bit of white and mix that in here. Because you can see this purple kind of starts going almost like a crimson color, like a little bit like dried blood. And maybe that's not such a bright color after all. So if we add some white in here, we can kind of change a little bit of that. Again, there's this little A here. Maybe I'll try to preserve a bit of that. Take some more white. Let's get more into the some blue in here. Need to get a little bit more white. I think you just should go a little bit nuts, go a little mad, and allow yourself to play here, just like I'm doing. Because we need to get some kind of color established to begin with, underneath all of the, of the color that's eventually going to be there. Okay, so we've got a bunch of these warm colors here. Let's, uh, I'm just gonna take my brush, still dirty with color on there. Take some cool blue and cool yellow. Let's make some green stuff happening here. eyes are going to be
just filling it up. Okay. How about let's make a warm brown. So I'm going to take this warm yellow, warm red, and warm blue together. We've got a warm brown. Now we don't have to cover all of the yellow. That's not really what I'm trying to do. I'm just want to be able to have lots of different layers of, of paint showing through. So even actually some of that yellow, maybe right in the face, I might just keep that there. Okay, I love these colors. That's cool. That's, that's turned out great so far. Um, I'm just going to keep on going here, so let's just, I think I'm just going to wash my brush, even though I don't mind all of these colors piling up, I'm just going to take a second to breathe for a moment. Pascal says, yeah, that one feels like there's another painting underneath. Yes, absolutely. It does have that quality, and, you know... Who knows how he would have worked like there's some artists will literally make a painting decide they're not happy with it and then paint over it and there's hundreds of examples of that famous examples throughout art history where um, we looked at Picasso's blue period a few months ago we painted the old guitarist and there you know during that blue period where he was you know I, 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 below the poverty line and, and basically starving he didn't have money to buy multiple canvases so if he he might be like i want to make a painting and i've got 10 paintings here eeny meeny miny mo which one of you is going to get painted over okay that one and so then they you know they x-rayed it and they can see there's oh look there's a painting that was painted over sometimes they're on the back side so you know potentially it could be unstretched and flipped around and then there's some artists who might do something like this. They might say, okay, ultimately I'm gonna, I, I want, I have an idea of what I wanna paint, but I wanna just prep it. I wanna just fill it with lots of color so that I can paint over those parts and give it that feeling of lots and lots of layers. Another example, I mean, there's just, there's so many different artists have different ways of working, but this to me seems sort of like a logical way for to just sort of get this painting up and running uh, let's see now just looking at the original what else could we do next uh, I think I want to get some of this red Maybe I'll take a bit of white in here so now I'm really starting to think about like what is the the base layer here that we need. That's gonna be underlying all of this. So I'm gonna paint Maybe I should be doing using a smaller brush for some of this. I think I will in a moment. But there might be a few layers of kind of of this that I, I could do. So okay. Maybe you know what I'm gonna look. I see this this kind of color 
that we painted on the other painting, I see a bit of it showing through in a few places. So, So I'm allowing some of that paint to mix and get some dirty qualities. And maybe while I'm here, actually, I'm not gonna go j white just yet. I'll leave that. Let's get a bit of um, warm yellow back onto the canvas here. And we painted this earlier. Obviously, this is underneath everything. So as I said, this is a great time to play around, experiment, try a few different things here. Okay, let's clean that brush. Let's go to a smaller brush now, and I'm gonna start doing some of the lines that were, let's say these X's and O's. And I'm gonna also hold my paintbrush a little bit further back. So rather than having, trying to paint really refined like this. I'm gonna hold it a little bit further away, which is gonna allow for a little bit m less accuracy. You could say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody want to make a painting that lacks accuracy? Well, in order to let go in, of your obsession with perfection and, and need to control everything, this might be one way that you can do it. So we're just building kind of some structure in a few different places. And yes, the paint is mixing into some of this wet paint. Um, if you wanted to write some words in places that maybe only you would ever see, you could do that. So I like when the paint mixes and I get different colors happening on the, the, 
the canvas. I could see not everyone feeling that way. And if you want, you could just let things dry. Next, I think what I want to do is mix up a dark color. So I'm going to take my, where should we mix this? Let's mix this right here. Cold, let's, let's mix a bunch of it. Cold blue, cold red, we mix together. And we get a very, very muted purple, right? They're almost across the color wheel from one another. So they're kind of canceling each other out. But since they are blue and purple, they're still going to, or blue and red, they're going to make a purple. It's just, it's certainly less saturated of a purple than we had when we mixed with the two colors that are side by side, the warm yellow and the cool red. Let's take some cool yellow. We mix this in here. It's going a little bit green. That just tells me. I need a little bit more warm red. And then now we've got a color that's basically the darkest color that we can get in our paintings. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm trying to get as much off my paintbrush here and then we'll go to a smaller paintbrush, but maybe I'll just apply a bit a bit this black I thought I was gonna um, you know what I think that's okay for right now and I'm just thinking to myself do I want to let things dry before I go on you know what I want to do let's do a little bit with some warm red We've got some cool red here, but we also want some warm red.
And I think I'm also, you know, actually I, I was gonna start doing a little bit of splatters, but maybe I'll wait till I get some of the blue here and then we'll do a little bit of splattering. Um, okay, I think, I think that's good. What, I'm gonna blow dry this because I'm gonna now put some cool blue over top. And while I've been really happy with the smudging that's happened, I think when I look at the cool blue uh, on the original, it looks like it was applied after some of the other colors had dried. And if he's painting, I'm not sure if, if he painted, um, I think he probably was using oil and acrylic back and forth. He would, there would have been, acrylics did exist at this time acrylics have existed in you know since like the 40s didn't really become commercially available until the 60s and 70s um but uh you know i think there was probably you know just like any new art material when it gets released there's a bunch of people get really excited about it so like wow i could use this okay so let's get a uh, hair dryer out here. I'm gonna mute the microphone for a moment. Okay, I like how this is turning out. So next what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, some more cool blue. I'm going to add some white to it and then I'm going to do a little bit of glazing with it just so that I can get um, let's see what size of brush Not too small. Maybe just the size. Sorry, just taking a second to think like, what is the appropriate size brush for this next blue that we're about to put on here? So this color is not too far off the color that we're ultimately gonna paint. But I'm gonna take a bit of it, and where should we do this? Maybe I'll just stick it on the opposite side here. I'm gonna take a, a healthy amount of white, which is gonna lighten it up. Uh, yeah, maybe just a little bit So it's a little bit lighter. The reason why I'm adding some white to it is because if I glaze with it and it's that same dark blue, then it gets more transparent and then it's gonna it means it's gonna get a little bit darker. So let's now take some glazing fluid. The reason I want glazing fluid is if I just paint this right now, I'm just gonna lose everything I just did, right? And I want there to be some of this coming through the next few layers of paint. 
and we can we can really control how much of those previous layers comes through by how much paint we put into our glazing fluid here so right now this is a pretty transparent layer but I'm, I like that especially to get started we'll see how it works and then we can always do subsequent layers Oh, I just realized there's that white. Well, let's do a little bit of this, and then we'll put some white over top of it. And then we'll maybe go back to this. It's a process, right? Um, I'm going to deliberately try to resist painting over everything. It's hard. It's hard to, like, just allow yourself to only paint over certain things so there's a little bit of of red there that I got on my brush which is okay but just for this thing I don't want it to go kind of brown or anything I just want to keep this good so I'm just gonna clean my brush and let's do a little bit of glazing with the white so let's take glazing fluid and white so you can see there's maybe two three to one white and glazing fluid That might be, maybe let's amp that up a bit more. And then mixing a glazing fluid with white is kind of tricky because you can't really see. Now there is some blue that's coming off my brush because I didn't wash it all that well. That's okay. Then we can do another little bit of layer with some more white afterwards. Paint coming off onto my Thank you. 
Where else is this needed? There are drips and things. I think I might do that at the end because those drips will take quite a while to dry. And I'm, I'm just, if I start putting drips on now, then I won't be able to paint over them for a while. So. So now we've got quite the network of of things building up on this surface, right? Um. Okay. I think that's enough for right now i might do an, another one where i get i'll do more white in a few places we'll build that up um but i did want to come back to do a few like x's and o's and things here so Now you could use um, oil pastels or anything else you'd like up here. We're getting closer to to really doing the black lines on here. So this is where we're starting to really think about like what is some of the last stuff. Like last little details that we want. Teeth in here.
ahead. I'm going to take some of this black. Bring that back. Um, okay, I think that's good. Let's, um, <laughs> Paula says, I'm trying to catch up. We are busy tonight. Heidi says, Paula, you're a model student. I like this one, but I have not uh, sat well for days, and I still need to finish my actress. Uh, the Yu Peng um, painting we made a while ago. Okay, I think again. I think I'm gonna blow dry this really quickly. I like how it's turning out. Really. My main thing is I want to be able to preserve as much of, you know, not as much, but aspects of this. I'll, just like his painting, I want there to be evidence of things below, right? So let's... Okay, so let's go back to our glaze. Uh, what should we do? Let's do the white again. This time there's maybe at least one to one white paint to glaze. So it's not quite as, not nearly as transparent as it was earlier. You can see, like, I'm looking at the original, but I'm not fixated on it, right? Uh, I'll go back to the, so you can see them side by side, but um, my goal is not a perfect reproduction. Neither, none of these paintings that we've been making over the past year and a half are intended to be perfect reproductions. This is just really mostly just white paint in here with very little glaze now.
so it's much more opaque. Okay. Is there anything else that needs to be? I feel like that's pretty good. I'm sure this we will we're gonna use a little bit of white at the very end as well so it's not like we're once you we move on where it's like we're gonna put away all the white paint and you know we're gonna begin the other painting in maybe five minutes so it's possible that after we work on the other painting I'll be like oh you know now that I look at this one I feel like I need to go back and uh, so yeah actually let's blow dry this Um, let's take we've got our blue with some glazing fluid still here right that's uh, it's kind of, it's semi-transparent not super transparent but it's semi-transparent so uh, maybe I'm just gonna go over most of where I want this blue or yeah the, this cool blue and then I can then decide oh do I want some air which areas need to be more opaque like down here it's definitely going to get more opaque I think this jaw just keeps getting <laughs> wider and wider Okay, so now let's take some just actual cool blue right out of the tube and then let's look for places where it can go. So we can paint it a little bit thicker or more thickly. some restraint okay. um, next 
first I want to get maybe just a tiny let's see just get a bit of cool uh, red in here oops it's a little bit much it's a little bit more purple I was expecting but this kind of greenish thing going on here so that looks like we've got some I'm just gonna put some cool yellow in here cool blue a little bit of white That's it, that's it. Um, yeah, okay, I guess that's it. Let's now take our small brush. And I want to take my cool blue and just do a few small blue lines Looking at the original, looking for some inspiration, but I'm not, you know, uh, basing everything I do off of it. It's just like, okay, where should this little, you know, where do the little things go? call for blue last call for blue anybody need blue anybody need some blue no no blue no blue for you John says that white looks really pale, Michael. Definitely not as intense as the. I mean, there's probably because I've used some glazing fluid in there and it's thinned it out because I, I wanted to preserve some of the transparency that is in the original. Um, I could go more opaque and maybe when I after I do some black lines, maybe I'll do a little bit more white over top, just right out of the tube. Um, 
It's 2 a.m. where Lolly is. Great to see you, Lolly. This one I'm really excited to try. She says, awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Paula says, "Do you, Lolly, you stay up all night. No sleep. Do you feel tired in the day? And Lolly says, I'm a bit of a night owl. I love these streams, too. So even if I don't paint along, I love to catch them live. So I see all you lovely people in the chat. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so usually I use, should, am I, I going to use, I was going to say, should I use black today? I never usually use black. I think I'm going to use a little bit of black. Oh boy, because really this is, what we're talking about is doing a painting so different than what we typically do. And... The reason why I don't often use black is it sits on top of everything. It doesn't integrate very well on its own. So in this instance, I'm going to mix black into my black that I mixed. Now, I'm not sure how well it shows up on camera. It does look darker. Yes, it is darker because there's only so dark you can get your colors when you mix them all together. This looks, I mean, it's, it does the job, but this I think I'm just going to use it to get even darker than I typically do. And I'm going to use a relatively small brush, not my sm like not a tiny small brush and this brush has been around a little while. So it is, you know, it's lost its square shape at the top, which generally would make it useless, but I keep some of these brushes around because Sometimes I like to do some scratching and scrubbing, which destroys brushes. But if I've already got a destroyed brush and I want to kind of be rough with the canvas, then instead of using a really nice brand new brush, I can use an old brush that is just sort of sitting here waiting to, to uh, be used again. Um, so let's take this black paint, mix it in. Ooh, that's nice and dark. And again, I'm also mixing it into my dark color so that even then it's slightly diluted. So there's still a little bit of, of you know, je ne sais quoi left in here. Um, so let's see see here. Where does this A go? This A kind of starts where this yellow is. I'm also going to try not to go over my lines too much as I just go over my lines. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Okay, maybe I'm going to do a little bit of this with a smaller brush. So what are the big areas of paint that need a bit of a bigger brush? Let's, let's zoom in for the first time today. Right, you can see all that those lovely layers we've been building up. I think I'm going to kind of almost like dry brush. I like kind of this look of seeing the texture of the canvas coming through. And I was going to do a lot of big solid lines, but I think I'm going to do lots of thinner brush strokes here. I 
right, so maybe it's worth just looking, showing you this angle here. Like, see how it's like, I'm holding the paintbrush, not right up at the tip, but much higher away so that I'm kind of floating above the surface and just going like, it's, the paint is, paintbrush is just basically just dragging very lightly. It's a light paintbrush, so there's very little weight to it. All right, so. get these really nice kind of dry brush lines here. Alright, so again, I'll show you the original in a minute, but just so you can see It's like I'm, I'm hardly touching the surface. And this is, again, great for someone who's a little bit more timid but wants to have this, ex try this experimental style. So it's, this is, I'm actually really enjoying painting in this way. I've, I've never really painted quite like this before. I used to collaborate with an artist many years ago when I was in undergraduate school and who did a lot of this type of work and we would paint on each other's paintings. And it was a lot like Warhol and Basquiat who collaborated because I was doing, um, using a video projector and or a opaque projector and projecting images onto canvas and tracing them like newspaper articles and then he'd kind of graffiti over top of them and that was so much fun I have such fond memories of doing that and it's a really great learning experience to collaborate with another artist like that and, um, and build up surfaces together my mouth is way more open than, than his, but that's okay.
This is really interesting. It, this also reminds me a lot of some of the very final works of Pablo Picasso. Rem look, have this sort of this face, this particular sort of like look. I don't know how to just like. There's a some of Picasso's very, very like literally the last few paintings that we know of his. Maybe I'll show a few here in a moment. Kind of have this figure who's. Um, kind, of, kind of almost like a haunting image of their self-portraits. Uh, where we see a lot of just there's the uh, kind of a person looking into the into the next life. And with a guy like Picasso, you might not be sure which way he's going up or up or down, right? Um, okay, let's back it out. So now I'm just going to switch down to a smaller brush and just get into some smaller details here. I could do this with um, with a Posca pen or something if I wanted, but really, I, I don't know, I think, I think I'll be okay. So again, I'm kind of holding the brush very loosely, very lightly. It's going to allow me to kind of get maybe certain kinds of marks that I might ordinarily not be able to get. So I'm so where do I want these next? few marks to go. This mark here almost looks like someone cleaning a brush. Wiping that paint off. Okay. Oh, okay, that's pretty, pretty close to what I want to be able to do with this painting. There's still a little bit of white I want to put back on, let's say, in the eyes. There are drips in there. Do I want to try some...
Do I want to try some little white drips here? So what this is... He says, it looks like Michael Jackson. <laughs> Lolly says, oh, it's a special day when the black comes out to play. Um, it sounds really interesting collaborations. I remember seeing some of your videos where you used a projector to paint portraits. I'd love to see the projector art you painted with your friend. Oh, those are... <laughs> That's over 20 years ago. I don't even... So I think they're in a they're rolled up in my parents' garage in Calgary. They're, I do have some photos. I remember documenting them, but those are photos that are on slides. Those of you that are a little bit older will know what slides are. <laughs> there's, there's also a large number of people who've never heard of slides. A lot of my students. I learned how how young my students are when I I made jokes in reference to Seinfeld and everyone is like oh yeah my dad watches that <laughs> and you're like oh okay no one here has seen knows any of the Seinfeld references okay I guess I am getting up there okay so how should I prop this up so that you can see this Um, if I put a jar of paint underneath, and so it's upside down, and I don't want to use too much of this because I don't want just drips going everywhere. And if, I mean, if everywhere is not first world problems, right? Ah, not quite wet enough, right? So I'm adding fluid acrylics. Let's try it. There were some drips down here, so. Just a very thick, big blobby drip. So I want thinner lines. interesting <laughs> how they started going in different directions wasn't expecting that
I'm kind of get going a little bit nuts here, but Gonna take my brush. Now and tapping a little bit. Okay. <laughs> uh so I think this is, I, I'm, you know, we'll see. Whoa. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so they've cut, all these drips have kind of gone in all sorts of funky ways. That's what happens, though, when you play things, un the unexpected happens. Now, I probably will paint back over top of it with a little bit of uh, black. Definitely different. Well, I don't know. Maybe I, I, I don't know. I was, but maybe I just got to sit with it and think about it. So maybe this is a good time just to transition to the other painting. Um, because I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I, it's not, I don't dislike it in this stage. I did want to put a little bit of black in here, but I think the next painting is going to have some black... Well, there's not really black sp splatters. So anyway, let's just put this aside. I, you know, I have my, my pastels, but I'm kind of enjoying painting. I was going to use some of the oil pastels and uh, oiled sticks. Maybe. We'll see how this one goes. So likewise, with this, uh, we want to build up a little bit of layers. Now, this is definitely done with pastel, probably. I, this is almost entirely done with pastel or ink uh, or oil sticks, oil paint sticks. Do I want to do this with... I don't know. Let's, let's look at this, see if we can zoom in and see, is, oh, okay, there is a bit of paint, there's a bit of ink in here. It looks like he painted the whole thing, the face, with black ink, and then went over top. You can see this is clearly oil pastel. All of this is, that's oil pastel for sure. Or, or not oil, yeah, oil pastel, why? Sometimes saying things, you're like, that, does, that doesn't sound right, does it? And then this is some purple paint. Okay, well, we got to put black paint on here first. Uh, Let's, let's do mostly paint. I think I'll do mostly paint, also because this isn't an oil pastel class, it's an acrylic painting class. Now, granted, we have just finished one painting, so I could do anything I want with this painting. Um, but... Um, and I'm going to start... This is my black paint that's got actual black in it. Alright, so... Usually, I only use this at the very, very end, but again, we're, we're painting a fairly unconventional artist today, so. Let's just sort of go right in.
so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of try to preserve a little bit of the facial structure here even though I think he painted this whole thing just a big black shape so just help me see a little bit of the composition This, this black paint is kind of drying, so it's kind of a little bit sticky, and um, usually that drives me crazy when I'm painting with, with paint and it's kind of sticky, but I like the kind of bit of a dry brush quality here. Now, I think he's probably painting with ink, maybe, or um, I, don't, I don't know if it's acrylic ink. I don't know if, maybe that existed at the time, and if it did, he certainly would have a had access to it. Let's uh, go down to a smaller black brush, or smaller brush with black paint, and some of those are going to be subsequent layers, they're going to go over top of other colors. Maybe that's good for now. Okay. So, which color is next? I think his red is next. So, let's put some warm red on the palette. And you just need a bit more of it. Yeah, maybe I'll just... I'm enjoying painting tonight. And I spend most of my day drawing all day long, so on my computer, so this is a kind of a different part of my brain and it's fun to get outside of that part of my brain. Because I'm drawing a comic book, a graphic novel, which will be published next year, next spring, I think, it, well, probably summer, I think, is when it's going to press.
And so I kind of, I like leaving some of these lines pretty rough. So not going in and kind of fixing them, just allowing them to be what they are. So similarly, you know, some of these, I'm going to paint some gray lines over top, but it's about building up uh, like a web of, of marks. So obviously this is a totally different, you know, where I'm painting with ac acrylics, whereas the original was in, uh, I think, just ink and, and pastel. But I might as well use what some of the, the benefits of using acrylic paint provide, right? Again, remember, so you can see how I'm holding my brush pretty high up and away. That's good for red. What should we do next? I think I want to blow dry it because I want to put some of the green and the blue over top. So that means I'll need some. Um, this to be relatively dry. <laughs> just looking at the painting we just finished and that is wild like I still don't know what to think <laughs> so we'll uh okay let's um let's continue here so let's uh we're gonna mix some uh, cool blue and cool yellow together. Let's do that right here. Cool blue and cool yellow. If anything, it needs to go a little bit lighter. So, um, 
I think I'll paint this, and I'll, as I use up that paint, um, I, I can come back and lighten it up a little bit. because there's so much paint you know it's just it's impossible to really lighten up a color when or a, a green like that okay so then let's just take some of this yellow here and I'm gonna go to a smaller brush. It's greenish yellow. I guess it needs to be just a little bit more green, lime color. Does this need to go? Am I missing something? Oh, I just got paint on my face, which is a good sign. That means I'm into the painting, right? I'm in it. is a bit of a gray so let's take our this black color in fact we barely need any of that on our brush let's just take the white and just mix it to the side here it doesn't matter if there's a bit of other colors in there I'm going to take a small brush and paint with it. Maybe I can even just use the paintbrush I use to mix. Now obviously it's a little bit different, like I can't really like scribble the same way that he did here. And I mean that in the best way, right? Like, 
obviously am a huge fan of his work. And I, I have no judgment when it comes to, like, the idea of scribbling as a, as a tool that artists can use. There's plenty of artists. There's an artist that we're going to look at in the new year called Cy Twombly, who's famous for scribbling. This is cool. I'm enjoying today's painting a lot. Sometimes they're a little bit uh, stressful for me. And, uh, you know, I was definitely I, I was a little bit anxious before starting today's episode because I'm a big fan of, of this guy's work. And... He was a big inspiration for me when I was in art school. And ha having, st I remember seeing that uh, Julian Schnabel film, Basquiat. I've probably seen it about 40 or 50 times. I remember as art students, we would watch it. We'd gather together and, you know, and sitting around having drinks. And sometimes we'd just be playing in the background. Um, but it was, you know, it really showed a very romantic idea of, of what being an artist uh, was like or could be like. and um, There's a great sort of fantasy sequences of him sort of, I think, flying around the city or with his dreams when he was really young. I don't think so. Zoom back out. You know, this paper has definitely got this weathered look. It reminds me of, like, um, like paper that may have even just been laying on the floor of his studio that he was stepping on or was used to, like, let's say, to put a dirty paintbrush down on. And maybe that's how this painting started. Like, it just looks very dirty. It looks like... Maybe other drawings were rubbing up against the surface, and then he was. Maybe there. Maybe that's how that 
the face was begun. There was just like an old brush laying on there and he just peeled the brush off and was like, oh, you know what, that could make a face. And he just starts drawing over top of it. I mean, he generated a ton of work. And one of the, the issues these days is because he made so much work and so many of it was just traded or given away that authenticating real work is 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 very difficult because a lot of it just shows up online on ebay and people buying it are they fakes are they originals you know i don't know so there is you know it, we've talked this often happens as soon as artists become successful the uh the black market starts to become very involved so let's make a uh a purple here. Should let's make it right here. Take a bit of. Is there any white left? This should be more of a blue purple. Could be even lighter than that. Is there any more purple in here? I don't think so. So we'll just let that sit for a, for a moment. You can see there's some green that is doesn't appear elsewhere in there. So maybe let's put a bit of that green up top here let's take this green Same sort of just dragging the brush around a little bit. Okay, now I think we need to go to our cool. Oh, there's a bit of warm blue there. I didn't see that until just now. So let's get some warm blue first. Where is that starting? Up here somewhere? warm blue over here. go to the cool blue.
looks like I'm gonna have to mix a bit of white into some of these, otherwise it's just gonna go too dark. Mm, maybe I'll just let's do that now. Let's take some white, mix it in with this. So I think just like we did in the previous painting, I want to allow the brush to kind of drag over the surface. We're, we're using again a different material than he did. So we have to, to try to kind of replicate a little bit of it. I want to have a bit more of um, a dry, transparent kind of quality. So when I'm painting over the black, I'm adding just a little bit more white into the color to make it a little bit more opaque. Just lightly dragging over the surface so it's very dry. Always go back and paint over anything if we're not happy with it, right? Nothing's written in stone here. Area 
probably going to use a little bit less uh, white in here because I don't need it to be so opaque. Which means it'll be slightly different color than here. And there's still white in there, so I'm not going full on with paint without it, but. Forgot to, to, I think there's a little bit more warm blue right here. our warm I guess we've got this right here this is just warm yellow and or sorry cool yellow and cool blue predominantly blue So it wouldn't surprise me if while he's making a painting like this, he literally has a uh, Grey's Anatomy textbook, the same one that his mother gave him when he was seven, uh, just laying there on the studio floor next to him or on a table, and he's looking at it for reference. And I'm sure some people would scoff and go like, really? This is what he's doing in, while he's looking at the textbook for reference. 
Like, wow, that guy's not very observant. I think, you know, he might be just sort of glancing at it and he sees something like this shape and that, and he just sort of like, oh, okay, I'm going to put something like that in. I don't think he's trying to, it's not like he was trying to do a realistic, quote unquote, realistic um, depiction of a face and failed and this is what resulted. Let's just back it out and see how we're doing. I'm just going to take a bit more of this darker green and conversation you guys are busy in the chat there talking about riding motorcycles I am attracted to the idea of one day owning a motorcycle but uh, I had a really bad motorcycle accident when I was young and went right through a barbed wire fence while riding a motorcycle somehow survived I have little scars on either side of my eyes it's a miracle that they didn't go in my eyes and I lost an eye so needless to say there's <laughs> an aspect of like eh, is that pushing your luck walked away once I remember a, a good friend of mine when I was in art school he said something like it's not a matter of if it's when you'll get into an accident while you're riding a motorcycle you will get into an accident so the 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 thing you want to do is be the best prepared for what happens when you lose control and the more training you have the more awareness you you have the more you'll be able to survive that situation i always thought that was like whoa okay so he was he rode his motorcycle all the time. Um, it's been a long time since I connected with him. go back down into the details here. Which is probably about close, right?
going to raise that nostril up. As soon as I painted it before, I was like, ah, that needs to be higher. Pretty good. When we back out again, I think it'll be nice and satisfying to see. It's funny, I keep on having these moments where I look down and I, and I see little, and I think like, oh no, I'm, and then I'm like, oh, that's actually, if it did happen, that wouldn't be so bad anyway. <laughs> so I think I'm smearing paint around or... pretty close to the end here. I painted out that nostril. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, going through a motorcycle on a barbed wire fence was traumatic to say the least. So, it does make one question whether one wants ever to do that. Again, it's one of those things you think like, Shh, do I need to overcome a fear and try it again and maybe it'll be better? You know, I don't, <laughs> it's, yeah. Okay. Um, I need to do a little bit of red back over everything, and that might be the end. Is that, are we there? There's a black splop there. I want to do the little, well, maybe we'll use fluid acrylic for that, to get that nice. I think I need a bit of white in here to make this a little bit more visible. Now I might paint. that pink and then we'll put warm red back over top of that pink and it'll really pop So let's, uh, that dry for a minute, and let's actually, let's blow dry it just to speed it up, because we're just getting close. I can't wait for you to paint these as well, Lolly. And I can't wait for you to, to share some of them with us. We really need to see what you've been up to, whether it's these paintings or anything else.
So you can see adding that little bit of pink to the, I mean, we could have done it with white, but adding, putting that down allows these red lines on top to just be really big and bold and they really stand out. Otherwise, they'd be sort of mixing optically with the colors that are there and just getting much darker. Reds are tend to be very transparent colors. So they're always really hard to kind of get that brightness that we, we might want from them. Unless you kind of build a little bit of um, an under layer like I just did. Okay, so essentially the painting is done. The only things that I'm thinking about maybe adding a little bit of black, uh, very fine mist with the with a toothbrush just to dirty this up. Maybe even before I do that, I'm gonna glaze very, very, very thin, um, just to kind of give a little bit of some dirtiness or something to the painting. So let's put some glazing fluid here. I'm going to get just glazing fluid on my brush. Maybe even I'm going to start with this gray. I don't think that's going to show up on camera. It's super, super subtle. It's one of those things that will be, will kind of just gently influence the viewer's perception of the painting. Let's do that again. Maybe this time. Like I'm taking like such a tiny amount of black. I probably could have, or maybe even should have, done a bit of this before we began. Because then I, I could have a little bit more integrated into the rest of the painting. But now it's good. This is actually, before I do any more, I'm going to blow dry this because then I, I could end up accidentally pulling up not just the paint I just put down, but the the original kind of paper color and even the, the yellow and as much as you know I want to paint it to be kind of, kind of wild but that could be really really frustrating especially when I feel like I'm minutes away from finishing Okay, so there's still a few areas that are a little bit um, still drawing, but you can see that's much more visible.
there, I mean, I could see, you know, there's a bit of this that seems is a little bit silly, sort of trying to give this faux patina to the painting to make it look older. Um, it's just for me, I think that the, the that part of the painting or the the original drawing, I think is a is an interesting aspect of it. It's not just like uh like. It, it gives it this sense of of uh, I think it's an important part of the composition quite frankly like it's I think this painting would look a little bit different if it was just on clean brand new white piece of paper without any of these scuff marks and things on it and it did feel really empty without it Okay. Again, I'm not sure how much of that shows up on camera. I think that's about as much as I want to do here. So, last, and I think I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way that the rest of that looks. Alright, it could go maybe a little bit more blue. forehead area. That's that's good. So now I'm going to take some of my black fluid acrylic and I want to do a little bit of splattering. Uh, I could use just my black and dip it in some water or even better would be to use like glazing fluid or pouring pouring medium would be even the probably the best um, but since I've got this this is basically fluid acrylic is basically a really super high pigment very fluid kind of paint so it's it's great for um, doing outlines and everything without you know if you I've heard a number of people talking about oh my paint is always getting really sticky and and drying out and I don't, I can't get really nice fluid lines. Like I could have done this whole painting with fluid acrylic. Um, you could hear. Uh, just kind of giving a good shake because I don't use these very often. And it might be worth just taking this painting and just kind of experimenting, right? So I poured that fluid acrylic in here. I don't know if that's... Okay, good, perfect, wow. Even better than I thought. Okay, so let's go right into this then. I don't know how much of this is gonna come up on camera, so let me just zoom in really close and then make sure this is focused. just so you can see, right? I'm holding my finger underneath here and then I'm gonna flick it. I'm amazed at how these tiny little spots, almost imperceptible, wow, that's cool. It. Uh, I see Paula says you know, this kind of painting would look would be great for little kids to do. 
you know, can you imagine doing this kind of little thing with little kids? They would just lose their mind, like the, the kind of spraying little droplets of paint everywhere. Okay, I don't really want to do too much in here. So let's move this one out of the way. I'm going to put more fluid acrylic on here. Right. This is an old toothbrush. I'm not going to use this for brushing my teeth. <laughs> All right, certainly not. Um, and let me just get that up there. Now, I don't want to do, you know, if I look at the original here. You know, there's not a lot. There's just these little splashes, and that's actually we can do we can do a little bit of that. That's a little bit of a different technique, um, but I think it'd still be fun to kind of add a few of these here and there. Um, this top area here. Let's. Gotta be careful. Getting pretty aggressive, Michael. This is fun. It's also just just as a thing, like you, at the very end of a painting, when you start kind of playing around doing this stuff, it you you do take a little. It is a little bit risky, right? Because you could end up splattering paint where you don't intend it to go. So let's take some of this fluid acrylic, and it's worth just let's just do a quick little experiment. Get even a bit of water into this fluid acrylic. Uh oh, okay. I just want to make sure. I'm about to like when it gets really wet. It's interesting. It's going in that direction. See, I'm glad I practiced. Okay, so. I want it to go It's a little bit more, but I, I, I can also touch things up. How do I want to go? Alright, so we can see 
in the original. There's these little splatters. I kind of obviously have gone a little bit. I still think that face is wild. Do I want to rein it in? Uh, let's take. I don't know. I like it. It's also just like kind of. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a bad idea to try to paint over these lines. Um. You know, as I look at it, I think... Maybe paint over this line. And <laughs> Bully says, no, Michael, don't ruin it. Um, I might just leave it I because like these lines are so much thicker than the original that really I like that it kind of took on its own a little bit of its own personality and that's what all of this is all about right is trying to create things and and allow it to kind of live a different different life maybe than it was of it. I want to come up here. I don't really like those white spots, but I don't want to get rid of them. Okay, uh, that's good, that's good, gotta walk away, gotta walk away before I start doing anything more to it. And that was, wow, that was fun to really play with a bunch of stuff here. So, those fluid acrylics can also take a little bit longer to dry as well. Um, today is, is the 30th, I'm pretty sure. This one's untitled, right? But you see, that's the 
that's the happy accident, right? That's the, a perfect example of a happy accident. But certainly, if I had thought that that was going to happen, I would not have allowed that to happen. I would have... That would have been the last thing on Earth that I would have thought about doing. I used a technique that is creates chance occurrences where the, it's kind of impossible to fully predict what it's going to do. And as expected, the painting surprised me. Wow, that's pretty good. It's interesting because, you know, just the other day, like, some of the paintings I've just done over the past, like, weekend, like, yesterday's Daredevil... Uh, didn't turn out quite... The, actually, although I do like it better than I did after I finished it. Um, but this it's a good reminder that, that not every painting turns out the way you want it to. And uh, it's just about continuing, just moving forward and not getting bogged down. And by, you know, this is paintings, basically, it says 164, next episode will be 165th. But obviously I've done two and there's been episodes where I do two or three or four or six. Um, uh, it's just, you got to just keep on going. Like, don't live in the review mirror. You know, you, if it doesn't turn out the way you want, make another one. That does turn out a little bit, and you might take three or four, but then, you know, once you get that one that turns out the way you want it to, well, then you're, then it's too late. Then you're addicted to painting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then I don't know what to tell you. I feel sorry. I'm sad that I've gotten you sucked down into this, um, probably the most rewarding addiction. <laughs> <laughs> that one could have. Uh, cool. Two wild, wild paintings. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for painting along with me. Please join the Facebook group. Upload your versions of today's paintings to the Facebook group. In, I think, two and a half weeks, we're going to get together. We're going to look at all of the artwork you guys have been working on, including the paintings you do outside of class that have nothing to do with what I'm doing here. And I can give you a little bit of advice based on my professional knowledge as an artist. So feel free to do that. If you want to support the channel, you can like and subscribe. You can comment on the video. You can comment on previous videos. I noticed Lolly's great at that. She watches old videos, comments on those old videos. All those little comments help the algorithm that YouTube does to help reach new people. And the, I think the more people that are spending time in their lives making paintings, looking at paintings, thinking about art, the, the more beautiful, the more um, understanding, empathetic world we'll have. And that's the world that I want to live in. That's why I'm doing these videos and I put them out into the world. Thank you, Lolly. Thanks for the contribution through the, the super chat. That's so awesome. Thank you for your, your contribution. All of the donations that people give help keep these shows running. There's also a PayPal link in the description below, and I hate mentioning it, but as soon as I started mentioning it, people started contributing, right? And that's the weird thing about being a YouTuber. You ask people to subscribe, and all of a sudden the subscriber numbers go way up. So that's why people do it at the beginning and end of videos, because and sometimes people need that little extra nudge. So thank you, everyone. We will see you guys on Thursday. Are we doing... Uh, I can't remember what we're doing on Thursday. I think we're doing pointillism on Thursday. Something totally different than this, for sure. So, And that's what I try to do. Mix it up and give people lots of options. Hopefully you can find the style, the artist that appeals to you most, that brings you joy when you paint. Um, we'll see you guys in a few days. It's been a joy. This one I really enjoyed. I hope you do as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing the paintings you make. Good night, everybody.
we'll talk to you again very, very soon.